Hello everyone, welcome. I just wanted to make a quick video before you watch um, the discussion between Chloe Deacon and I. Um, what you're about to watch is the start of a series that I'm about to begin that's based around um, hearing from undergraduate and early career environmentalists about a range of different environmental topics and issues. I feel like undergraduates are severely underrepresented when it comes to environmental media, usually for good reason. We obviously don't have as much of an expertise in particular areas um, and we have a smaller scope in terms of experience, but I feel like this will be a really good opportunity to hear from some um, undergraduate students. So basically this series will be a range of, um, so basically this series will be a range of so basically this series will be a range of conversational like discussions where either one on one or in groups we'll be discussing um, topics ranging from volunteering or the pressures of studying environmental science um, as well as other varying ecological um, controversies and concepts. I really aim to generate a high level of understanding um, and general awareness amongst the broader community, not necessarily people who are not necessarily people who are involved in the industry. I also think that this is going to be a great forum for people who are studying um, or who have just finished studying um, outside of the university context, which I think is really important, particularly at the moment. If you think that you'd really like to be involved, feel free to send me an email. It's alexdodge, A-L-E-X-D-O-D-G-E, -E, all in undercaps, at deacon.edu.au. Thank you. <laughs> I'm consenting to be recorded. <laughs> <laughs> That's very conventional. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to provide a little bit of context. Okay, go um, for it. First of all, thank you so much for coming on so early. Um, to everyone that doesn't know, it's a Sunday morning. <laughs> um, so Chloe is one of my peers at Deakin University, and Chloe, I reckon you're probably one of the most environmentally passionate and connected people I know. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm really excited for you to be here so we can talk to you in ask some questions. I've got a bunch of questions I want to ask you. Yeah. Um, so the first one is what led you to studying environmental science and what were you doing previously? Oh cool, thanks for having me as well Alex. Um, I, previously I was actually an interior designer so I studied that for two years um, and what it essentially boiled down to was the lifestyle I guess for me. I wanted to do something that felt a bit more meaningful um, and yeah, I didn't want to ever have to live in a city and I knew that if I did a degree in environmental science, I was probably most likely going to be outdoors or hopefully lead towards a career that was outdoors. So that was the kind of spark initiation for me, ditched old interior design. <laughs> um, did you find that you could actually sort of connect the two? In some um, Yes and no, I found that like, I got a lot of project management skills from interior design and professionalism and going for jobs and things like that. And yeah, there is, and drafting and things like that, not necessarily. I did a sustainability to, um, unit in that for building materials as well, which was really interesting. But yeah, I think there is and just study technique and building your confidence. Yeah. In sure. yeah. Um, what are your current interests and focuses? Environmentally, <laughs> um, I ooh, if you want, but um, well, before we went into lockdown, there was the spider grab migration, which I'm pretty um, I love it's my favorite time of the year when it's in winter, which is surprising. <laughs> um, so yeah, look at her learning about the over harvesting of that and seeing it firsthand, and then the pier got um closed down this year for social distancing, but um, not soon enough because I think last year it was a third or two thirds of their population was wiped out. So um, that's something that I'm kind of very interested in at the moment. Cool. Um, do you find that you're applying things uh, from your environmental science course outside the university context? Um, for volunteering and stuff or just general learnings? Both. Uh, general learnings, yes. I think this degree, I also, I just want to put out there, I'm a massive fan of this degree. It's the best thing I've ever done. And if yeah. anyone's thinking of it, do it. Yeah. Um, but I think I've just learned, I've really harnessed my um, <clears throat> my science brain, I think, and I've really kind of honoured it a bit more. And just everyday thinking, going 
how things might work or why something might function that way or just little things like that yes and a bit more systematic in my thinking as well um but concepts as well yeah i do um range management with wombats and wildlife rescue so they are very applicable also. Were you doing were you doing those before the course as well? Um, I was doing the Wombat Mange. It was the Wombat Mange that actually got me into the degree. I had originally planned to have another gap year <laughs> and then um got told that I'd have to reapply overseas if I went. So um it all happened in a week and I was a uni student again, but I'd seen that wombat that week and didn't know what mange was. Yeah. Um, and then got linked up with someone, got involved, and then the ball just kind of kept rolling from there, and I kept meeting people. I was like, okay, I probably need I've it. I've got to do this now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was sort of the same, actually. I um, was originally a performer, and oh, yeah. I was known as, like, the dancer at school, mm -hmm. and I think, first of all, I got sick of that title. <laughs> um, yeah. But, yeah, two weeks out from exams, and I saw this course, and I was like, I did chemistry. I loved chemistry. Mm -hmm. Oh, go science. Um, but yeah, I saw this course two weeks out from exams and I suddenly had a goal. So I, I totally know what you mean by like the ball starts rolling and then there's just like, it's just, there's no other option either. You go to the science and I think a lot of, I think there's a lot of pressure on people, especially in your 12, because I'm a couple years, years older than you. Yeah. Um, and looking back at it now, my mum's the year 12 teacher as well. And I just look at the stress these year 12 kids have. And it's just, I don't know, like you can make a change at any time. And I think if there's any like little doubt in your head about what you're doing, then pull out, have a breather and go in again. Like I think that that was probably the biggest thing that like with the interior design is that this whole environmental thing was niggling in me the whole time and I knew it's like six months in that it wasn't yeah. I just finished it but it wasn't um yeah. yeah what I wanted to do but you can definitely be more than one thing you don't just have to be a dancer or an scientist. yeah you can be all of it yeah for sure um do you have any plans for after uni <clears throat> I do have plans whether they're able to happen or not in this climate <laughs> <laughs> um but I do I bought a van last year I think you've seen it. Um, so I've been doing that up over ISO, which has been really good. Yeah. And I plan to go around Australia for who knows how long. So head west first. And I want to, because they have the Deakin Ecology Register and yeah. a few other sites and things like that. So I want to um, volunteer on PhD projects and mentorships, um, sorry, honours, and just get my experience that way. I was tossing up between that and honours but at the moment my brain is fried from studying five years yeah. is too much yeah. um so yeah I think that's just going to be the best way and just see where I land if something pops up I've got like a very strong interest in like southwest western Australia in like Albany and Denmark and Esperance and stuff like that so that's where I'm going to head first and get my I want to do my dive masters um oh uh, yeah in England or just like do a big lap but Whereabouts do you want to do your dive masters? Pardon? Where do you want to do your dive master? I think the Ningaloo. Because you can also work and do it at the same time to save yeah. a bit of mula. Um, so, yeah, that's the goal. I, yeah, that's the goal. Drop into Mount Gambia, do the free diving, but we'll see how it goes. I'm <laughs> telling them I'm finding a job. <laughs> yeah. 100%. Are you, so you told me that you're working at, I think it's, is it Southern Ocean Education? Is that what it's called? Yeah. Yep, yeah, keep exactly. Speaking of jobs and being employed, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, could you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, of course. Well, I'm not really employed. I am. I'm a subcontractor for them, but I haven't been there since March. But that is the Southern Ocean Education is an education group that goes seaweed Sally. <clears throat> it goes to primary schools, kindergartens, um, high schools, events, things like that. Melbourne Boat Show and just provide the hands-on experience with um, marine wildlife. So we have a little uh, rock pool tub that has all the rock pool animals in there. So you've got your urchins, your sea stars, um, sea slugs and things like that. And then we have, I think it's one of the largest collections, education collections, don't quote me on that. Um, but we have all the taxidermied sharks and the bones and massive whale vertebrae and things like that. So 
we're able to give kids a bit of an educational kind of, not a lecture, it's very interactive, um, but kind of like a sit down conversation and then we move and they get a hands and touch, they get to feel and touch and ask all the questions and yeah, it's, it's fun. <laughs> it's fun and that's all over Victoria. Almost like a um, healthy Harold in a sense. Oh, is that the giraffe? The yeah. <laughs> yeah. I do wear a wig though. I wear a seaweed wig. That's my ego. <laughs> um, with that, what do you find that kids are most interested in? Uh, it really depends on where they live, I think. So I, a lot of the kids that live Bayside are just all for it they already know some of them know so many so much more than me <laughs> in some occasions um I remember one kid asked if, if he was four years old or five years old and he asked if if sharks had swim bladders because they're fish and I thought that that just blew my mind that one he could comprehend <laughs> what a swim bladder was and yeah. that's together but they don't have swim bladders because they've got like a fatty liver yeah. um but just like things like that so kids surprise you all the time um so yeah that's more bayside whereas if you go inland towards bendigo um they don't have necessarily a relationship with the ocean and that or they haven't been to the ocean so that can be a little bit taxing um but it's very student-led so if one if there's a kid that's got a question about something you build on from that um they know the plastics they know the pollution um they know to have their nudie lunches and what goes in what bin and what can happen if your waste ends up in the ocean and that. So they're very, we need to give them a bit more credit. Um, but yeah, it definitely starts from where they live and yeah, what their parents um, yeah. views are. There seems to be like a, definitely a regional bias. Um, yeah. Even when you're just traveling, you experience mm -hmm. it as well, necessarily mm -hmm. like with a group um, like yours. Do you, do you know if those regional areas um, and those kids have something that's based for where they live? Like as in like the wild black presenting thing? Yeah. Or, uh, I know there are a few different mobs that do, um, there are a few different mobs that do, uh, my dad's just here. Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> there are a few different mobs that do native wildlife incursions, but um I'm not too sure what they have access to or what they have funding to in the kindergartens and things like that too. But yeah, I think maybe that might be even more suitable for them yeah. so that they're depending on what is in their immediate surrounds. Right. Do you find that there's um, any huge differences between children and adults in terms of um, learning and passion? Um, well, yeah, as I kind of said before, they... It definitely stems from home and if the parents are making an effort, if it's kind of drilled into the kids from a young age, then um, you see that in the kids as well, they're little sponges, they soak them up. But there's yeah. also a big knowledge gap with the parents as well. And I find I love when the parents are there because you kind of get to school them in a way. <laughs> um, but they have their own set of questions as well and there's things they've grown up their whole life not knowing even like those... Um, what we thought were like those jellies on the beach, the little half moon ones yeah. with the um, shell casings and things like that. That wasn't something I knew until maybe three years ago, but there are still parents that don't know that and things like that. So, um, yeah, I think all round education could be good. <laughs> yeah. Do you think that there's um, anything in the, in the ugh, start that sentence again. Do you think there's anything important in the context of what you're teaching? Um, do you think anything's missing? Um, it's, there's only so much you can fit in the time that you're allocated and the attention span of the kids. I definitely think there could be more emphasis on, um, plastics and rubbish and things like that and yeah. the effect that they have. I think there was also, these are more just build upon, these are just build, would build upon the business model that we've already got. Um, but even like a rock pool ramble, like going to the actual beach and having the kids, I think hands-on learning is so much more important, seeing it in the flesh and having the experience, yeah. um, which we would know as well, going on camps and things like that. We learn um, so much more in those situations. Yeah. So yeah, I think that would be probably the next step. Um, and it would be the parents taking the kids outdoors to those areas if possible. Yeah, I guess there's a bit of a funding gap as well 
specifically in the environmental side of things. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> a shame. How do you think we could facilitate a transfer of passion for the environment from childhood to adulthood? Mm, I'd like to keep it going. Yeah. So I um, find that there's a lot of kids who are, as you said, like they're sponges. They take in a lot as a child and um, they, they're very passionate. And then you watch them grow up and that passion slowly fades. Do you think that there's a way that we can sort of retain that? Mm. Um, I think that it needs to be trendy. It is. It's kind of like the beginning blocks are there with like your tea cups and like your little yeah. things like that. But I think it needs to be the social norm to yeah. give it, I can't swear, but to care. <laughs> um, Do you think it's um, accessible enough? Um, yes and no. Yes and no. no. No, you go to a supermarket, you've got your packaged food there that's cheaper than your fresh yeah. fruit and veg. So not necessarily, um, and it's also probably a matter of ease for some people, but I think I was even thinking last night um, prior to talking to you, um, I've completely lost my train of thought. <laughs> How, what was I going to say? Sorry, it happens to me all the time. <laughs> I was back, it does. It was cool. Whenever I <laughs> it was good. Trust me, it was good. <laughs> I was going to say I had value. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> um, so, about your time in Mozambique. So, you volunteered in Mozambique. Was that for your work placement or was that just no, for a global that was, Yeah, that was for my global placement. I did my work placement at Moonlit Sanctuary. Oh, um, yeah, the yeah. So it was in. I was working with on a whale shark conservation project. So being a data collector for them. So the learning dream, how to the absolute dream. The absolute dream. I got a taste of my dream life. Um, yeah. And I got you know, an absolute heartbeat. We, I love. Ido and I just missed out on whale shark season in Mexico. Mm. It, uh, uh, it was we devastating. Were, yeah, was that in Belize? Or? No, um, in Mexico, just off the Yucatan. Okay. So they, they just missed us. Oh, bummer. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is one of the only, so it was Topo Mozambique and it was one of the only places, I think it's all year round whale sharks. I don't think, and they're juvenile males. So they usually get to, I think, about five metres, which is still. That's no, still a sizable, that's still a sizable animal. Nine metres. I don't know. They're still huge. Whatever, <laughs> like you think they're going to be. Big, but nothing compares you to that. I kind of wish that I started smaller now because I've just kind of gotten to the next thing from here is like humpbacks, like in yeah. Wales. <laughs> but, I don't know to get a conga, <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I chewed off too much too soon. But no, it was it was amazing, um, and I learned a lot in the marine science. I think our degree is wildlife and conservation. There's um environmental sustainability and land management and then there's marine biology but I didn't want to do just marine biology because I wanted to be able to work yeah terrestrial as well um so yeah do a few like subjects that were marine to cover me for that and then do my placements in a marine environment but um yeah and then also working in a place that was still um a developing country was really interesting as well and there were we worked in I worked in the school and ran an education program there and there were kids that didn't like there was no one swimming at the beach like there were no locals in the water and I couldn't fathom that I was like you lived here like why weren't you there in the water every day um yeah it was very that, simple in Mexico yeah. as, like the Yucatan is relatively touristy compared to other places mm -hmm. in Mexico um but there's still a lot of locals there. Like it, mm. in the place that we were staying, it was uh, relatively local compared to like somewhere like Cancun. Um, yeah. But yeah, no locals in, in the water. Maybe yeah. like two. Yeah, it's super interesting. Um, yeah. I guess like maybe if you've lived there your whole life, it just becomes like you take a bit for granted. I don't know. But it was, they, they were switched on kids as well. And they knew and there was a lot more because um, there, there was a paper released about the whale shark um, and the bycatch in the ghost nets and the fishing nets. And so a lot of the industry in that localised area is trying to get away from fishing and into um, tourism. So taking them on 
um, a handreel charter or just something else, being a guy for some particular reason or something like that. But um, yeah. Yeah, it, it wasn't nece even necessarily the, the local fishermen that bothered me. They didn't all have nets. It was like you could see out the back the Chinese barges um, and other foreign countries doing their like heart, the heavy harvesting fishing, which was really upsetting. And there's not a strong um, governance over there as well. There's a bit of corruption. Um, yeah. So, yeah, and it's just, it's a, it's a hot spot. Like I've never seen wildlife like that anywhere in Africa. You've never seen wildlife. I've never gone to Africa. <laughs> but, um, yeah. <laughs> what's, the, um, what's the language over there? Um, it is Portuguese, but there is oh, um, There is local languages as well, the, di um, the tribal dialects. Yeah. That, um, your last point actually leads me into my next question. Um, mm -hmm. What were the most inspiring and most disappointing things that you witnessed? Oh, goodness. Um, inspiring? Know, it's a very broad, it's a very broad yeah, question. Yeah, hard. I think... I was off. That was a four-month-long trip. <laughs> I'm meshing everything. Uh, <laughs> the was that the same that. trip that you went to India? Yeah. So when you yeah. said the most, um, like, what what was the word you said? I don't know. Yeah. The conflicting word. I just thought of India. India. <laughs> um, the most disappointing thing that I saw were probably, or no, I came in one day actually, and there were fishermen that had brought in all their catch. And it was just a massive boat, like a massive wooden boat, just full of everything, like fish, uh, sharks, like things, everything. Wow. And everyone gathered crazy. around and was, it was like a mini pop-up market almost. And they, anyone that pulled a phone out or a camera out, they got really quite like aggressive towards. Um, and I get it. Like, for me, it was concerning, I think, because I've, like, come from this wildlife. But at the same time, it is um, – that's their, like, that's their livelihood and that's yeah. their food source. Like, they don't have – like um, an essential part of their economy. Yeah, like, they don't – This is a huge trade-off, um, yeah. especially in those kind of countries as well. Yeah. Yeah, I think it was just conflicting for me. But I think going back to way before when you asked what I am um, – I apply from my degree. I think that was another thing I learned very quickly is that conservation isn't so black and white and it doesn't always mean saving an animal. And that was quite a hard pill to swallow in the beginning. So I went in there, I'm, yeah. like, I'm going to save all the wombats. Like, yeah. oh, my, oh my gosh. <laughs> and now I look back at that and I think it was almost a bit naive. Um, I think because, everyone, there is like an element of that for most people going into this course unless yeah. you're going into it with a very um specific goal or like a specific mm -hmm. interest i think there yeah. definitely is an element of that um when i was looking at the course like some of the first images are people on the cape conran trip um with the small mammals so yeah, yeah i know what you mean um so what do you think is so important about volunteering like why should people get into it um even if they're uh, not from even if they don't have a background. It's fun, you learn things and I think that like in the child and you get to soak up all the new information that you're learning and um even if you I I have volunteered on quite a bit, but um even just like honors projects and things like that, just like a quick little one night even volunteering like helping a friend out um for powerful hours like you then develop this knowledge base and you're like you're not an expert but like you're a mini expert amongst your friends because you've had this one great night of catching hours and learning and soaking up all the information so i think you just become a bit more well-rounded in your opinion you get to network massively um you get to taste taste test everything that you might like to do and find out what you might not like to do. Yeah. People um, forget that it's free as well. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> That's the bonus. Yeah. And it's, you just, all your, it's just your time. And I think a lot of, we, I'm massively guilty of it. Like we get caught up in sitting on the couch and be like, oh, I can't bother. But when you come back, you never think, I hate, like I regret that. Like you don't, yeah. oh, I wish I stayed on the couch. It's never that way. Like it's just, 
I don't know, it's super cool when people, if it was for people that aren't even doing environmental science, I know mum came with me a lot and did the frog data stuff that we did. Um, and she found it really interesting as well. And it was just, it was just a good bonding experience. Yeah. So um, yeah, it's very multifaceted. To benefit. Yeah. I can't I think of it. Uh, yeah, I've definitely up my volunteering in the past few, not the past few months because I've been at home, but over the past year, and that's just been such an invaluable experience, I think. And yeah, it's a shame that more people who aren't involved either in our course or in the environmental industry don't do it. I've got two more questions. The first I remember what I was going to say before as well, I think. <laughs> I, remember, I think I remember what I was going to say before when I lost my train oh, of thought. Hit me, hit me. Okay, because we're talking about how to carry on. Um, environment like being environmentally conscious from childhood to adulthood and I was thinking I, you have to make it applicable I hope this lives up to whatever standard I put it on it has to be applicable I think to what you're doing in your lifestyle so say that you are working oh my goodness I've been watching the office so let's say you work at Dunder Mifflin right like let's say you do that um like the tree is obviously going to be really important to you so it's how do I, I don't know how I could even word it like just focusing on a, an area that is very relevant for you I think could really encourage your like if you're a surfer like you're going to care a lot more about the ocean like things like that and finding a niche that um resonates and you can be passionate finding something that you can be passionate about because it directly relates to you and there is an element that directly relates to anyone like it's not no one is completely cut off from the environment is, might just not be a priority, which is un like understandable because not everyone has the same degree of passion um, that you and I have um, and can live the same lifestyle. But yeah, I think that's, does that come across? Did that come across clearly? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah I 100% agree. Like it's so much mm -hmm. easier to generate that kind of um, enthusiasm if mm -hmm. you're, if it's applicable to you. If people want to get into volunteering post COVID, mm -hmm how do you reckon they should go about it um join all the facebook groups like there are so many facebook groups um deacon ecology register i'm part of like the wa volunteer register all those things there's um wildlife conserv conservancy oh my goodness dad i can't never pronounce that word Past do awesome like summer rangers programs like Past just it's super accessible yeah and it's not it doesn't actually mean um Sometimes it might not even be physical labor kind of stuff or and physical involvement. I've got a friend that volunteers for mange management and just does their online social, like social stuff, <laughs> social media. Um, so it doesn't have, there's so many different ways that you can offer to help out as well. And people are just grateful for the help. Like you don't, just because you sign up doesn't mean that you have to um, be there nine to five every other day. Like you can, they're just grateful for the help. So whatever time that you can give, just be really transparent and honest about that. Wildlife Victoria is awesome with that as well. You have like a literal on off button on you text the line and if you're off duty, you're off duty. If you're on, you're on. Then they'll text you if there's a, a case that comes up. So yeah, that's just, just subscribe to all the emails and ask around, ask friends. It's like, yeah. yeah. It's who you know. It's who you know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, are you doing anything during lockdown at the moment in terms of like online volunteering? I wish I could say what? yes, but my brain is at capacity. Um, yeah, I think it's just study. It's our last semester. So um, I'm putting quite a bit of effort into that. Um, there's quite a lot of on interesting online content and um, I'm teaching yoga as well. So between those two <laughs> and cleaning the house multiple times a day just to keep me <laughs> <laughs> my mum probably wishes I had that problem but I don't <laughs> <laughs> no nah, it's, it's still not good enough she'll clean it the next day anyway <laughs> thank you so so much for coming on um, I really appreciate it I hope it goes like we've got so many interesting um I was gonna say nut jobs then <laughs> not nut jobs <laughs> really interesting people um with really diverse views some like quite strong yeah. opinions as well so I think that you have 
the work cut out for you. Um, yeah. I'm excited to see it all together. Me too. I'm excited to have like a group, a group chat as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. This is all like linked, you think, having the kids delayed. Um, I seriously feel like people who haven't graduated, um, specifically their undergraduate, are like so underrepresented within this industry, mm-hmm. in, um, yeah. particularly in, so in media. Yeah. Uh, for a good reason most of the time like we obviously don't have the expertise or like the uh, as big of a background as people like I, our lecturers mm-hmm. <laughs> we're such like a valuable part of this industry yeah I think we deserve a bit more credit <laughs> in terms of obviously that we can't do um we can't we're obviously not to the same degree as our lecturers, but um, we have this knowledge base that the average person doesn't have. Like we have all this, in- this four year, three years worth of um, degree that others don't have as well. So we do have maybe perhaps a more well-rounded. Um, Definitely a more, a more nuanced perspective. Um, yeah. And I think so it's... I about- and then I got really distracted. <laughs> Everyone's coming in, I told you. <laughs> It's sort of gotten to the point where I think standing outside Parliament House and shouting climate change is bad isn't enough, mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. which is one of my main motivations for this yeah. project, I guess. Yeah, I think it has to be a lot more tactical and, like, obviously there's a lot going in the world as well, talking about, um, like, intelligent protesting and messaging and things like that as well. Like, I attended the climate rally and it was amazing. Like, it was it was so peaceful, it was so friendly, um, it, yeah, and I think that idea of protesting in sometimes the public mind tends to lean towards that violent, um, aggressive, like, things like that, which is just so far from what it was, because um, that was one of my first protests, but I think it's more so, it's like the letter writing to your local um, MP and councils and things like that it's more as like all like as much and it's not what I thought it was it's like a very almost top-down approach I think that's the right way yeah top-down in terms of you need to get that legislation like it comes from the government essentially like that's where I think that's something I've probably learned this year the most prominent thing I've learned this year is that yeah your protesting is awesome like your presence is appreciated but like put that write a letter like you need to that's how I think things are going to get done is if there's more pressure because your your protests are a day-long thing but it needs to be consistently applied yes in my opinion um and I think that's a a good way to listen as well and have very very clear objectives about what you want um as well because lots of people go into the climate rally and perhaps maybe without making too much of a big assumption, not knowing what um, Greta Thunberg was actually wanting to come out of that. There were three, I can't remember them off the top of my head, um, but green energy and things like that. So, yeah, just having really defined this is the purpose of what I'm writing for, what I'm protesting for. Yeah, 100%. Well, thanks again for coming on. (laughs) Um, no. hopefully, hopefully this recorded properly and yeah, I can see <laughs> I a little to recording too much. <laughs> what was that I can see a little recording button so yeah I think it should work but if not then oh well, oh, well do it all again <laughs> <laughs> awesome thanks so much Alex no worries this around. I look forward to seeing you soon in the flesh <laughs> All right, straight off. Have an amazing day and hopefully catch you soon. Yeah, thank you. Such a nice start to the day, Alex. That's so good. Have a (laughs) good one. All right. See See you later. Bye. Bye.